right. 9.30, perfectly on time. Welcome everyone to Neurochino. Uh, the way it works is anyone is welcome to come and present a paper um, to the best of their knowledge, tell us why they got excited about it, what the paper is about, and then we discuss it. Today we have, as promised, uh, Victor, who's going to present a paper to us. And Victor, take it away whenever you're ready. Hi, good morning. Thank you. Uh, the paper I will present you. Perfect. So uh, this is a uh, paper published last year, and it's interested. It's of interest of me because to me because uh, it's linking two things that um, I'm doing right now. The, the thing I'm working on right now. And the thing that I've been working on in the past and uh, I'm still interested in, basically, um, before I started my PhD, uh, I was doing uh, research as a research engineer, sp uh, specialized in uh, resting state for functional imaging and uh, analysis. And now um, it's uh, as part of uh, Michel's project, I'm more... Um, I'm still interested in resting state, but and functional uh, brain imaging, but it's in relationship with uh, white matter and um, more specifically, in general, um, white metal lesions. And this is a paper that is uh, part of a group of papers and a, a whole study linking um, white matter lesions with um, resting state function, uh, resting state. Um, uh, functional um, damage uh, or uh, um, disruption, and so uh, so, so the, just the title: damage to the shortest structural path between brain regions is associated with disruptions of resting state functional connectivity after stroke. Um, so, just to start, for those who are not really um, uh, used with to, to work with resting states. Resting state is um, a way to uh, acquire data where you ask, uh, uh, usually with the fMRI, when you ask uh, the, uh, the participants uh, not to do a specific task, but just to let their uh, thoughts come and go and uh, to, to not fall asleep. That's uh, also a requirement. Uh, but that's it. And it's a really interesting um, paradigm because uh, first, it well, because it does not depend on task, it, um, it can be done with people who have uh, several uh, severe um, behavior, behavioral uh, troubles. So because they just have to stay um, calm in the machine, they don't have to do anything special. Um, and also, it's uh, it's interesting because it's the with this kind of uh, of paradigm because you don't have uh, tasks um, that you you know exactly the onset of the different uh, task of, or for example you cannot just look at uh, a specific um, uh, a specific signal in the brain that would uh, that you can model and then try to find in the the different uh, part of the brain you have to just look at the, the data and try to correlate the, the, the data uh, between the different regions of the brain. And this is something that appears is that different regions of the brain, distant regions of the brain, uh, do have a correlated signal between them. Uh, and this is and these regions we call uh, resting state networks because they show a synchronous signal during a resting state. So they form a network. And so this kind of signal, this kind of resting state signal is of interest because it's been shown that, uh, that, uh, that um, these, um, uh, these structure, this functional connectivity uh, between different parts of these resting state networks, uh, this functional connectivity is disrupted in uh, patients within a variety of different um, uh, diseases, and especially in this case uh, here, uh, the uh, the stroke uh, stroke th that uh, create damage to the white matter does have an effect on uh, resting state uh, networks and the resting state connectivity um, between the different regions of these uh, networks. So what the um, now to the paper what they 
tried to well, try what they did was to look at one specific uh, at specific measures for example uh, one of them is uh, what they call um, sspl uh, for the uh, it's the uh, shorter it's a way to do it's um, the shortest path uh, linking to um, two brain regions so for example here you have between region A and D, you have like a direct path. So it's a, an SSPL of one. Uh, oh, can you see my mouse? All right, thank you. Um, here you have, uh, for example, in this case, you have like where you have an X, you can see that the direct path has been uh, cut by a lesion in the white matter. And this uh, means that the um, the relationship between A and D must go through uh, an indirect path. And so the now the SSPL is two because it has to go through a two link to reach from A to D. And so the these so they are there, so they are like direct structural disconnections here, as explained in the part A of the figure, but they are also uh, regions that are naturally not connected with the direct path, but still show um, resting state connectivity or uh, resting uh, functional connectivity. And it is assumed that it's, uh, this, um, this functional connectivity is uh, possible through um, indirect structural con connection. For example, on the left here, the uh, SSPL of two, because it requires naturally two um, uh, sorry, to uh, link uh, through uh, through the the white matter, the, uh, going through one region, uh, one intermediate region, and if you disconnect uh, one of these region, one of these link, you it will create it will have to take another path, uh, and it will increase here the uh, SSPL to three, um, as uh, as is shown in the figure. So this is one of the things that they look at uh, to. Uh, to estimate what they're interested in is to estimate the effect of uh, these different um, cases, like uh, direct link that has been uh, disconnected or uh, indirect direct link that has been disconnected. Um, so this, uh, this increase in SSPL in both direct and indirect uh, connections, what what um, these uh, disconnection have uh, as effects on the resting state uh, functional connectivity. So here is the the group average lesion overlaps of the um, the stroke patients that they uh, study. So it's just uh, to show you uh, where in general are the, the lesions um, to study the white the um, the functional connectivity, they had to use um, a parcellation of, uh, of the gray matter to, to be able to correlate different, uh, the signal from different regions together. And so here is the, uh, uh, the, the uh, an image of the parcellation. They, they also use a tractography atlas uh, that they, they built uh, with um, the HCP dataset. Um, linking to, to try to link uh, to, to create a, a, an atlas of uh, structural connectivity between each of the brain regions they have. Um, and so they can, so, so this is what they did. So they, they, bi they binarized, so they, they linked together all the different regions and then they, they, they put a threshold to say, okay, this region and this region are structurally connected. And this is the, uh, the red regions here on the, on, the, uh, on the connectivity map. And then they also, so this is the map of the uh, direct, in fact, uh, uh, connection between the different regions. But here on, um, on the right part, you can see, also the, also the indirect connections. So you can find again the direct connection with the, an SSPL of one in red. And then in white, these are all the connections that can be done through just one intermediate region. And then the, the more regions you need to go through, the higher the SSPL and the, the bluer the color is here. Then 
there is the effect of lesions on this uh, uh, on this uh, structural connectivity maps uh, uh, matrix, and uh, as you can see, uh, this uh, this structural connect. If you have like a large stroke in uh, the white matter, you will have this connection between uh, different regions uh, of the brain. Here, it's in the right hemisphere, and you can see that in the right hemisphere, you have a very high increase in, well, uh, in uh, disconnections or uh, in, in increase in uh, SSPL, uh, while in the, right, in the left hemisphere, there was no, um, no effect here, but there was also an effect on, on the connectivity uh, between the region of the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. So on, the, on this diagonal here on this uh, matrix. Then this is just a summary of what kind of data they, they are uh, analyzing here. So this is the, the, uh, a patient, um, the uh, connectivity, the functional connectivity matrix of uh, a patient. So in red, you have the, uh, the functional connectivity, which is uh, like synchronous between different the, the two regions, and blue it's uh, uh, in a counter, in a in phase opposition. So basically, one uh, there is signal going one way in um, in one region, it's going in the other way uh, in this uh, in the other region. So it's anti-color related, but still it's a if it's a functional connection, sort of functional connection. And so it's, this is in blue and in red, the, as I said, the uh, functional, uh, the, the positive uh, correlation. And um, they remove the, the mean functional connectivity of the healthy group and divide by the, uh, the um, standard deviation of the, function, uh, the healthy group. It's just a kind of normalization of the data to get the, um, the functional connectivity, the functional connectivity Z score of uh, the, the patient. What they obtained then is uh, that so they, they first uh, looked strictly to the um, structural data that they had, like the structural disconnections, and to see exactly what they got without even uh, looking first at the uh, functional connectivity data. And they show that, well, quite expectedly, we can see that in patients, we have an increase in um, in SSPL, so an increase in the the number of uh, intermediate regions um, the the structural link has to go through to link to regions. Um, with, uh, like we, as you can see, uh, there is a lot of um, basically yeah, there is a lot of regions where there was an SSPL of two uh, that are not there anymore. And now we have a lot of, of a link that has to go with a, an SSPL of seven or plus in the patients. One thing that they show also is one of the, the main result is that um, about 20% of the, um, the connectivity between uh, the direct connectivity between the, the regions in the patient, in patients are, um, um, are impacted basically it's saying that 20% of the, 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 the direct connectivity uh, has an, an increase in SSPL. So there is a, well, sorry, I'm a, I'm a bit, uh, <laughs> I might be a bit unclear here. So, so I'll just stay in, uh, take it again. So what I meant is that 20% of the direct link direct connection between regions uh, has been severed uh, in, the, in general in the patients. And also 20% of the indirect uh, link has been uh, severed. So meaning that in each case, uh, the, uh, the original path has been broken and it in requires an increase in SSPL to restore this, uh, this link. Meaning that um, focal uh, lesion will have a very, um, very important effect on the connectivity inside of the um, inside of this brain patient's brain. Uh, 
Uh, interestingly, the and as uh, as we could, we could uh, almost guess with the previous uh, result. So interestingly, there is a very high correlation between the um, <clears throat> the direct disconnections and the indirect disconnections. Basically, you've got usually as many dis direct disconnections as um, indirect disconnections, which is not necessarily something that you might have expected. Maybe, uh, uh, well. I don't know, they, yeah, <laughs> sorry. Um, and so the next, um, the, the next result is just a, a map. Uh, so they, they took both direct and indirect um, uh, disconnections. They, and they, they put it, them all together to create a, an index um, saying that can be used to uh, explain the, the degree of disconnection in the brain and to, uh, to correlate with the, um, the, the lesions in each subject. So, and, and so they, they, they did some kind of regression to get this map uh, of the, where, where the, um, the lesion would create the more disconnection in the brain. Um, and then there is the uh, functional connectivity analysis power then, and they they separated both uh, the, uh, the binarized uh, the the uh, so, sorry the uh, positive correlation between regions and the negative correlations between regions so to to have two groups, and they they uh, explored whether the um, the disconnections would have an effect on these. Um, uh, on these correlations and this functional connectivity, and they show that there is a strong effect of uh, disconnect of the direct disconnection uh, on functional connectivity. So basically, if you have two regions that were directly connected, um, they will you will have a very strong uh, uh, disruption of the functional connectivity between these two regions, and. It is also the case for two regions that are not directly uh, connected. There is also be um, a disruption of the functional connectivity um, between these two regions, but it's uh, uh, not as strong as with direct connections. So, and you have uh, equivalent result, although not as strong, but equivalent result with negative correlations. So you can see that it the um, the score here increases, but this is because we are looking at negative, so it's getting closer to no correlation, basically. So you have a disruption of the uh, functional connectivity, both in direct, uh, or in uh, between regions that are both direct and indirectly connected. So this all shows that um, the um, the the lengths of uh, well, so this first this show uh, obviously that the um, the functional connectivity relies uh, uh, well is strongly impacted by the um, the, uh, the structural the structural disconnection created by the um, the, the uh, white matter lesion from strokes uh, and. In a specific, specifically, it shows that the um, the direct re, the um, the direct link the direct connections are the the one that will be most in fact impactful uh, with uh, the with regard to the resting state functional connectivity. But one thing that was not uh, really explored before was that the uh, also the indirect connection have uh, a really strong impact. The indirect disconnection also have a strong impact on the uh, functional uh, connectivity. So the, this is basically the, the main results of, of the article. Um, and uh, yeah, so sorry, um, uh, I think, that's sorry. That's about it. It's. Uh, I think it was quite an interesting article. It's. It's part of the the whole. 
the, the, the old study of resting state and uh, white metal lesions. And it's uh, quite interesting, but if you have questions, you're, you're welcome to ask them. Thank you, Victor. Uh, not an easy paper to present. Um, and thank you all for asking questions in the chat and for uh, other people to chip in and answer it. So Victor could focus on his presentation. Um, I can see one question already to uh, Leah, shoot. Yeah, there was before Michelle, but I cannot go. <laughs> and um, yes, uh, thank you, uh, Victor. I was thinking, um, are there any like uh, interesting like observations between the two uh, hemispheres uh, um, kind of correlations? So if we have a lesion on one side, if the contralateral is um, mm, uh, there are some kind of a correlation in terms of uh, this measure that they evaluate. I was thinking about the diastasis. Um, uh, well, they um, it's kind it's. Part of the data, basically, uh, we can see usually in the uh, the, the bottom uh, the bottom left of the the, the matrices, but um, they I don't think they really um, uh, looked into it like deeply, but they did say that um, the uh, the uh, the contralateral uh, connections usually were direct connections and that these were the one that were the most impacted uh, by the these disconnections so the resting state functional uh, connectivity was probably really impacted with this kind of uh, disconnections but if you does it answer your question or uh, i'm not sure uh, yes yes um, i am i will look for thank you Thank you. Lovely. Thank you. Michelle, you had a question as well. Um, yeah, thank you. Super cool paper. And um, um, this is great. Uh, they managed to dissociate direct from indirect uh, disconnection and the relationship with decrease of functional connectivity. Um, I have a question that is related to the anatomy that they used for trying to uh, assess this, uh, this question. Um, is is that right that the atlas that they used didn't have subcortical regions? Um, I think that yeah, they used the uh, for the functional connectivity because it's all based on the functional connectivity at first. They they used the Gordon atlas, uh, and I don't think it has a subcortical nuclei. So uh, I'm just looking here. No, I don't think, I'm, mm -hmm. maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think there is subcortical nuclei. So they don't look at subcortical connectivity at all. Maybe, yeah, I, I didn't look at, uh, at this specifically, so I might be wrong, but if you look at the, uh, the here, the, the slice here, you can see that the, oh yeah, it's not, a, not not assigned as they say, uh, which is what is in white. So no, so yeah, that's it. And so basically, oops, sorry. So basically, um, I don't think they looked at uh, the uh, the subcortical nuclei and connections. And uh, it's, so the method is great, and it's just a shame that the atlas didn't use uh, 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 subcortical structures, it's like the brain flattener paradox uh, that we discuss about with Steffi. You in this? Steffi. But yeah, it, I, <laughs> I think it's because they um, they use, with the Gordon Atlas, they use uh, the whole uh, surface-based uh, uh, functional connectivity um, method. And I don't know how you do, you, I mean, I don't think you can do surface-based with uh, a deep white, the uh, deep, uh, well, sorry for the new sub gray matter nuclei and so so my uh, yeah yes yeah, you uh, well you, yes you can but uh that um but maybe not at that time or not with with the garden parcellation um 
My other question was, did they try to relate the decrease of functional connectivity, the effect of decreasing functional connectivity to just, the distance of the shortest path? Is that so, sorry, so, sorry, just I, I just realized that I just did what, what I just say is wrong because okay. I can see that here there is a, a white part in the matrix, matrix cool. which is related to the, um, the, the gray matter uh, nuclei cool. so they did they did do it cool uh, uh so yeah my next question was did they try to do a correlation between the length path and that is required and uh, or disconnected and the reduction of functional connectivity so like um the more distant you are in terms of uh, uh length uh, the less you'll have a decrease of functional connectivity. Um, I don't think I have seen the specific one. It's uh, like the, the result that is like uh, great and that they're showing is really that uh, when it's direct disconnection, you have a bigger effect than when it's indirect. But we can see that the SSPL you know, you can be further and direct. You can be like two, three, four, five. Um, and I was just wondering whether there is a physiological effect that the more distance you are, you know, the less it will have an effect. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'm just looking because I, I don't remember seeing that, but... Mm -hmm. because they they do uh, well they did try to look at uh, an index that well the, the index that uh of total disconnection that i talked about about the um the fact that they put all together the, the disconnections to to try to uh, it's the total number of disconnections so yeah they, they do have the index but I, and I think they just use it to, to try to regress where in the brain our, was the effect of the strongest, but not for the. Uh, no, yeah, no problem. Yeah, no um, problem I hope I'm not missing. I'm not no. missing something. But. And then, uh, oh, like Patrick got a question. I, I'm just gonna give you a break. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, yeah, really, really cool paper. Thanks for presenting. Um, with regards to Michelle's question, I was just wondering if you wouldn't then expect like a floor effect because basically the the further apart two regions are in terms of their uh, shortest pathways, um, the less they should be connected anyways. Mm -hmm. So if two regions are then, let's say, um, correlated with 0.1 or something, like very weakly, then uh, you, you shouldn't really see such a big effect anyways. Um, what do you guys think? Yeah, I, th I think, yes, the, uh, the furthest it is from... Uh, from the the regions in terms of direct structural link or indirect structural link the the yeah the the, the weakest it would the, the functional connectivity should be but there might be exceptions i don't know uh, it's something that is i don't i didn't quite see in the article so um so as a question here just um so if we assume the further we are, the weaker the connection. Would that simply be a methodological limitation because of the distance that we have to measure? Or is there a physiological uh, phenomenon that we can observe? Mm. I can, uh, if I can comment on that, I, I don't think for the functional connectivity that distance really matters mathematically. So you don't have this kind of bias. That's a correlation. So far or close as far as your same profile it's the same profile um but then the further you go the more you interact with other regions that just you know it's like your circle of friends 
if you go far away, you're going to start having new friends, even if we keep our connection. <laughs> uh, and, um, and that's why the effect is less, is like, you know, you're, you're still very active and you keep your profile, but we, we will reduce our interaction. Thanks. But I do think that there is, uh, like, the, it's not, we well, of course, there is the mathematical part, but it's true that it's still brains that works for, for real and that really needs there is a real need for a link between regions that are uh, functionally connected. So if it's, uh, if the path that we observe is very long, maybe we are missing something. Maybe it's a connection that we are missing. And it's not like, a, oh yeah, but it's just mathematically connected because with a like six link and for some reason it still works. Maybe it's just, no, no, no there is a missing link literally somewhere. That is not uh, that we don't have in the structural data, and but then I think it's it would be really interesting to look at, but in this specific case because they are looking at uh, analysis of group of regions on groups of subjects, uh, it's not as important. But uh, in the the grand scheme of things, yes, uh, it would be interesting to look at. Michelle has another question, I think. Oh, it's my last question because I can go on and on and on with this. But uh, uh, so very interesting in the results. So decrease in functional connectivity is bigger for positive correlation than it is for negative correlations. And is this just by chance, or do you think there are like different mechanisms supporting this? opposite correlation, and that's why the effect is not that big? Uh, I yeah, I, I think um, I think it's quite a complicated issue because there is probably a part where it's a, it's a true difference between the positively uh, correlated and negatively correlated um, uh, regions because maybe maybe uh, the, uh, the positively uh, connect, uh, correlated regions means uh, that there is uh, like they, there is some kind of really uh, uh, a real way to make them uh, like kind of resonate together. I, I don't know exactly a term, but I think yeah, resonate is like a good good way to explain it. They, 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 they if they move together, it's maybe easier for them to to to, to be synchronized uh, together than uh, if they are in a phase opposition. Uh, but at the same time, I always wonder if it might be also due to the way the data is pre-processed because I know that there is there has been some troubles with interpreting um, some of the uh, well maybe not anti-correlation but yeah it's um, it, it's not an easy subject I think the, the because the anti it's true that the anti-correlation is here but I can often see that it's not as um, as as well defined as the uh, the correlation. For example, if you look at resting state networks, you can have you always have the um, uh, like for example the the positive part where you have the as you said the the one the part of the resting state network that are positively correlated, and usually we just look at that. But if you switch to the other parts and look at what is negatively correlated with these resting state networks, you can see patterns and you can see some that are related to other resting state networks. So you can say, oh, these two resting state networks are actually the kind of the same, but uh, in opposition, uh, or maybe it's, they are related together, but uh, are, one is active. Well, one is activated. It's not a proper term, but let's say activated with a bigger. Uh, double commas, but uh, yeah, it's. Um, I think it's it's a difficult question. It's not something that I can really explain, but it. I th yeah, the negative correlation is interesting and should be further researched. But why there is more positive than negative? Not sure yet. Keeps the world balance. If there's more good. <laughs>
Um, I have a question for you from the chat, and that is, first of all, thank you, Victor, for the presentation. Um, just to your last comments, what conclusions do you make with these kind of data, SSPL, in interpreting functional connectivity, resting state connectivity in patients with stroke? <laughs> this is a very general question. Um, well, the, the interesting thing with this kind of uh, disconnection is that it shows that the brain relies a lot on the um, on the direct connect uh, direct connection between regions, but it can also because it's not a, because we don't see a complete disconnection between resting states uh, or, or the functional connectivity when you have a direct disconnection. Uh, we don't see a complete uh, destruction of the functional connectivity. It's a re it's an important decrease but it's not only that um, we can see that there is some kind of uh, or already some kind of um, uh, resilience uh, to this kind of disconnection and this is and the resilience is even more uh, marked with the uh, uh, indirect pathways so this is something that was that I find quite uh, interesting is that I thought that there would be like one pathway between uh, two uh, regions uh, that are uh, far apart and that when you cut it with a brain lesion like you would completely erase uh, the, the connection and it would uh, wreak havoc in the brain but as a matter of fact there is a uh, it's it's there is a possibility to go around and it's as a whole the the whole network is much more resilient than what i was expecting and um, even more so, even more so in the case of the um, the indirect um, connection connectivity, and it might be because they are not actually for the data. One of my interpretation is that um, the reduced decrease uh, in functional connectivity in the indirect uh, disconnection in the indirect uh, path disconnection might be because uh, it's uh, they are not looking at the right path because they are looking at the shortest path shortest path and saying okay if it's disconnected it will have an impact and see and say and they say okay it's not always the case and it's not super strong but maybe it's because it's not the shortest pass path that uh, the uh, the brain uh, is connected through uh, in these two regions maybe it's somewhere else and so sometimes they they hit right and it uh, and it we yeah, can see a, a stronger uh, decrease in functional connectivity and sometimes uh, they don't do it they don't get it right and so it doesn't and in if you do the the mean of all of this we will show a, a not as strong an effect as an indirect connect uh, of a direct connection but uh, that to me that's maybe a limitation but they did say that um, these um, this uh, direct and indirect connection uh, are, well, they say it for the direct connection at least, that this, uh, the, the show, seeing where, uh, which can, what kind of direct connection has been broken uh, is a, has better, has more information about the uh, resting state functional connectivity uh, impact than the, uh, just the lesion size or the lesion locations. It's really about the, the direct path that are being uh, cut. And in fact, now I say that, I think it's, it's increased the, my point about the, uh, the fact that maybe they're not looking at the right connection when they are all, all the time when they're looking at indirect connectivity. Maybe it's, yeah, it's going somewhere else. So whole, a whole field to study. <laughs> Thank you, Victor. Um, related to that, a uh, quick question from me before I hand over to uh, Patrick and Michelle again. Um, so resting state obviously for clinical stroke populations is a very useful tool because especially with aphasic patients, you can get information that you cannot really get from task fMRI when patients cannot talk, for example, in the scanner or comprehend language. Um, how long is the sequence? Is it already something that could routinely be acquired or is it still a nice research tool but needs some trimming in terms of the acquisition time and parameters? 
Um, well, usually nowadays resting stick data, it, it takes about uh, 15 minutes. The, the scans are about 15 minutes long, but you, you usually don't just get the, the, uh, the functional data because you need also the uh, structural data to do registration and everything. So I don't know exactly uh, how long you prefer a subject to be a patient to be in the machine, what's the, the max limit you, you can have. But the um, I'd say that for the, the minimal, like the going inside of the machine, taking the uh, structural uh, scans and then the functional scans, I'd say minimum 30 minutes. Um, so, so it's, to me, it's quite, it might be quite long and quite short. I don't know exactly where the, the, the whole, uh, the whole story about it uh, for for a healthy subject, a healthy participant, it's not that long. The most the the, the, the biggest problem is uh, not to to fall asleep uh, if uh, you're tired or something like that. But yeah, it's a uh, I don't know enough with that. Yeah, it's, it's still it's still slightly too long for a oh, okay. normal clinical routine. Um, but I don't know for the tractography, for example, we could played a trick that we cut the sequence in two and thereby removed motion artifacts and those kind of things. But thing I guess is, we're yeah, getting just, closer. Just a comment. Thing is, uh, functional connectivity, well, the functional imaging in fMRI is still very noisy. And I think it will remain very noisy. And the longer the, uh, the sequence, the, the more noise you can try to filter out. So since we are already working with patients that have their brain like altered in some ways if you cannot remove enough signal you might end up with uh, something that is not useful at all so yeah that's another problem i can see that my question kicked off the chat oh my god okay. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the questions was but we can surely cut it down can't we uh, the other comment was that uh, that's why Mantini and others are working on predicting resting state from EG signals. And then we got a copy and paste from the paper with all the details on the methods. Thanks for that. Um, questions from the room, Patrick. Yeah, so this, this refers to the uh, topic that we already tried to tackle with the negative correlations. Um, and the, the um, slightly less impact of um, disruptions, white matter disruptions uh, for the uh, negative correlations in resting state. I'm, I'm still wondering like how to interpret uh, negative correlations. In general, you would, or it's, it's easy to assume that um, positive correlation would mean something like an excitatory um, uh, um, activation between two areas, whereas negative correlations would mean an inhibitory cor uh, um, correlation. However, this is completely wrong as we know, right? So from an electrophysiological standpoint, it's just not, not as easy as that. Mm -hmm. So I'm still wondering if it nevertheless would make sense to potentially compare the, the uh, networks of negative connections or the maps with um, some neurotransmitter maps or receptor maps to potentially get a bit of better hint on what might be going on there between two areas. What do you think, Victor? Um, I think that might be an interesting uh, thing to look at. One fear that I have is that uh, if if you say that if you say, for example, you have two uh, two resting state networks like that are perfectly out of sync, like one is completely anticorrelated with the other. Maybe it's because for me you have a, a complex relationship between them that are in that. Um, involves in both cases both excitatory and inhibitory uh, neurotransmitter for example uh, you might have some part of the networks that are ex exciting uh, the opposite uh, the um, uh, the opposite uh, resting state network 
um, when they are um, uh, like not uh, well how to say that I have the picture in my brain where it's like uh, if it's activated maybe it will it can it can send like uh, excitatory, excitatory or inhibitory um, uh, information well uh, um, to to the other resting state networks but when it's for example when you look at the the peak and forth in uh, in the activity and say uh, this is the uh, the only thing that matters it's it doesn't mean that when you are in the trough it doesn't mean that the neurons are doing nothing and they are not activated so it might be also one also an, a kind of activation in the of these in these neurons uh that are passive uh, that are passively doing something for example they can be passively uh, ex exciting or inhibiting something and the opposite is true with when it's uh, on the peak of the uh the, the signal so it's really hard to to predict uh what kind of relationship you could have between two these two networks because maybe it's a there is a passive disconnection of other regions that uh, disappear in during uh, uh, the an active active phase or maybe it's a an active uh, disconnection or something like that so i think it might be a mix of a lot of different things and but but maybe it's super simple and straightforward and we we just have to look but uh, I, I'm I, I doubt that that it's yeah. super simple because other people that that work on that for years would have figured it out by now yeah right? probably yeah the the other thing uh, i just shortly want to to mention or, or to raise is regarding your suggestion that uh, they might have just looked at not the the uh, correct or or relevant path, but the shortest path. Um, well, it's it's really intriguing to think about that because um, we would assume that, or it has been assumed that um, the shortest path shortest path length makes sense from a biological standpoint, right? The, the brain tries to conserve as much energy as possible and tries to, as, as all biological systems, uh, therefore tries to use its resources ideally. Hence, there is a strong, well, a strong case for using the shortest path between two areas in order to, to interact uh, between the areas, not going to, to some other distant areas. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I remember that um, when it comes to, to brain disruptions or, or um, lesions, that one argument for neuroplasticity is that you could potentially use other pathways here. Um, as soon as the direct pathway is, is blocked or is uh, inhibited for some reason, such as for a lesion. Um, so I'm wondering if the results that you show have something to do or could be interpreted in that way, like having something to do with or, or suggesting uh, that this undershadowing or usage of another more indirect path would be truly a potential mechanism for, for um, a plastic recovery of the brain? Um, I mean, the article sure does seem to go in this direction, but I don't think that we have enough information to exactly say anything like for, for sure here. It's a, uh, it's a bit tricky. Uh, I, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> this, uh, no, no worries. No worries. This is a hard question. Uh, I think we're grilling Victor out of his comfort zone now. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, it's more like it's more really? like did the did the authors tackle this? That's what I'm trying to ask you. Yeah. <laughs> to make this fairer. <laughs> because um, hmm. I don't think so. Um, I mean, it's also a question open for the whole plenum, right? Like, what do you guys think? Does this mean, okay, they, they basically, or, or 
am I just talking rubbish and this has nothing to do with one another? So you mean the, the hang on, can you rephrase your question for the plasticity? So, so basically, I remember, like, I'm not in plasticity, as you guys know. So I remember that one, one argument for a potential mechanism of recovery of a function was that if two regions are disconnected and the function itself can be recovered, it might indicate that the, the functional connection that is associated with the specific behavioral outcome um, just goes over another like mediator, meaning it increases basically its path length. So I'm wondering if their results basically could be interpreted as, as yeah, that's, that's totally feasible or if their results can't be used to basically uh, falsify or or validate this assumption. So with plasticity, there is not just one mechanism of recovery, right? Uh, and yeah. we haven't really fully disentangled the ways the brain recovers. So taking a longer route by going a different way is one possible way to uh, recover a function. But you could also completely shift area, shift hemisphere, and there is this dynamic dimension across time. So it may not be one mechanism for everyone and it may not be one mechanism across time, but it might actually have a dynamic change as well. Um, and I don't think we with at this point yet where we can completely answer that question, certainly not with one, one single paper. No, no. But, but they could have, uh, uh, that's a really good question, Patrick. They could have explored not only this decrease of functional connectivity in disconnected areas, but also increase of functional connectivity in the new path that is taken to try to reach to reach a region that is not now not reachable because the connection is cut. And, and that would have been a beautiful double dissociation. Um, and, uh, but I, yeah got to get my head around how to measure that. I, I just reread the uh, the part of the discussion where they, they might talk about it and they just say that, uh, well, they show that it's, it's important to look at indirect re uh, connections. So it should be done more, basically. <laughs> they, they don't go into details, but they, they say that it's a result that uh, encourage people to look at uh, it more in terms of brain stroke and, and brain lesions and uh, white metal lesions. They don't discuss it much. There's always more to do. <laughs> Michelle, you also had a question, right? Yeah, that, that was more a commentary. And so, and I really like this paper, um, but the idea that is behind it is a hierarchical processing of information within the network. And, uh, and with Chris, when we did our uh, software on the study of brain disconnection, we had a different vision on what functional connectivity is which would be every network is a melody in the brain. Um, and we try to assess a little bit what's happening in disconnected regions, whether they are disconnected directly or indirectly in functional, in, in, in functional network using entropy measurements. So we'll tell you how complex is the pattern of variation that is inside a region. And what we found is that when a region is disconnected directly or indirectly, or indirectly, as the pattern become less complex, as if an instrument has been taken out or an entire melody is not played anymore in the brain. Um, but that's because we have a different, you know, we project a different vision of how the brain works. And that, that's why like, uh, like the result might be uh, 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 con contrasted. Was that a question or a comment? It was a, it was a comment. Yeah. <laughs> still i mean the like just showing that it actually impacts um distant i'm saying distant but when what i mean is uh areas that are not directly connected so distant in terms of uh shortest path length um just just showing that this also is affected like the functional connectivity here um 
it's actually really quite quite a cool fi finding. Yeah. That really, well, one still has to to identify whether or not this basically just shows a general principle, right? A principle that indicates uh, the the higher connected, the the better is our uh, communication in the brain overall, or um, the if if our brains well by losing connections, this this basically affects more than just the the connection itself, but really this this indirect pathways. Anyway, I think now I'm I'm losing it a bit, so. <laughs> Probably good for a laughter at the end. We're also coming to the end of our time today. Is there one final question, comment? No, all happy. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much, Victor. Uh, and thanks for, for putting up with us grilling you out of your comfort zone. Very much appreciated. You did super well. Um, thanks for the paper as well. Thank you all for joining us uh, this morning. Have an exciting weekend, science, and we see you next Monday. Bye. I fed my brain.